so we will just go ahead and get started, and because I know I will go long, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry, just, just get prepared. Uh, my name is Nick Kalem, and I'm the children's pastor at Life Center in Tacoma, and um, I've been there almost 12 years now. <coughs> Almost 12 years, getting, getting close to that. As the children's pastor? As the children's pastor, yeah. I had interned with that church for about a year and a half. So I guess in total, it's probably closer to now, I'm in, getting closer to 14 years. So it's been, it's really funny to, you know, to think that there's kids who were born, like when I was interning there, that are now, you know, they've aged out of the children's <laughs> ministry, you know, as attendees and such. Uh, it makes me feel old. Get off my lawn. <laughs> Good deal. Well, this is the uh, lab. Oh, I almost said workshop. This is the lab titled Work, Pray, Feel. And uh, we'll just let everybody get situated. Everybody does have the, the, the handout. Lots of blank space on the handout. We've got... A couple people right back there listening to me. Oh, oh God, bunch of people need one. Yeah, we're working, we're making her work. We won't, we won't need the handouts um, just, for, just for a second. Let me start by saying this. I think the message that Damon just gave really works and it really takes away for our, our topic uh, during this lab. Because we all know that the demands of ministry are many. And there's so many things going on, it's very easy to get out of balance. And there's definitely times in throughout the year where we are more busy than others. And it's, just, it's very difficult to maintain some sort of balance in life. Because when life... In the ministry gets busy, family ne neglect starts to take place. But then we want to switch over and spend more time with the pastors like, where are you? So, you know, this, this balance here, we can, it really plays with um, us physically, emotionally, and mentally. So we're going to try to cover some of these thoughts today. Uh, there, and there's unique, unique demands that are within children's ministry that make, make this um, imbalance all, all the more of a problem. Ministers are prone to self-sacrifice, putting others, other schedules, other needs, others' needs above their own. So then you add in your own family schedules, um, and you know there's little from keeping us from going off the deep end or just like really calling it quits in ministry. Uh, so achieving balance, or at least uh, parameters by which to measure our imbalances. Our hand balance, putting some things in place that we can see I'm out of balance here or I'm out of balance here. Uh, when we can get some of these things in place, uh, it increases our enjoyment for ministry, it, it increases our consistency in ministry, definitely our longevity, and it, it, as well helps us avoid prolonged stress, helps us avoid inconsistent work, ministry, and then this, this word um, called burnout. If anyone has ever felt like, I can't do this anymore, you might be on that verge of burning out. And um, I don't want to approach this idea of burnout as a negative thing. In fact, I kind of have maybe have a unique perspective on, on this idea of avoiding burnout. I feel like maybe that should be our goal, burning out. And I get that. From the scripture. Why would we want to leave something in the tank for us to have reserved? In fact, it says 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27. Don't you realize that everyone that, that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. You're not there just to enjoy the scenery as you're running. Run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what it should. There's more to that verse there. So um, I don't think many marathon any runners here. I used to be a runner. Not anymore. 
In fact, they kind of got winded walking from the, <laughs> from the main doorway. I'm sorry, they were coming here because I was, you know, it's raining. <laughs> got here, caught my, caught my breath before you walked in. Um, I don't think many runners who train for like, you know, the Olympic marathon would say, okay, I need to save some energy so I can do my victory lap. <laughs> right? They, they have decided, I need to win this race. I'm going to put everything I have, every ounce of my energy, everything into winning this race. And then miraculously somehow when you win, you find the energy for the victory lap. Right? So maybe we shouldn't avoid burnout. Perhaps maybe we should just be a smart runner. And I'm going to try to go through this, this first part of this page pretty quickly, so I'm going to have to speed up here. We need to know our course. We need to know the season of our course that we're going, our courses that we're going through. So that means you need to be on top of your calendar. Plan carefully in your calendar. And don't just seek to fill up the calendar thinking that the more you can fill into the calendar, the more you're going to get done. That would be actually progress. Really, it may not be progress at all. It might just be busyness. Don't be afraid to say no. As you know your course and your season, and if you've gone through ministry cycles a little bit, usually following a calendar, you know, like the, the calendar year and the start of school, we've got Christmas, you know, all these things, we begin to see these, these places where we know that we can push really hard and then take a, take a step back and, and maybe pace uh, a little bit differently. Build margin into your schedule, you know when you need to push and when you can rest. And I think it's very important that, you, that we schedule rest, vacation, and downtime. Doing what fills our tank. And um, one little secret is doing, not doing anything, like vacation and not doing anything, that doesn't necessarily fill the tank. So if you have hobbies and activities or places that you'd like to go that fill the tank, don't just, oh, I, I just, I'm burnt out. I'm going to go rest and not do anything, not schedule anything for a while. Because at the end of that vacation time, you're like, oh, I didn't do anything. Why, why didn't I do anything? I don't feel any re re refreshed. So doing nothing doesn't always fill us up. We need to train appropriately. The second thing there. If we're going to run a smart race, we need to have uh, appropriate training. We, we should have veterans, mentors. Like if, if, you're, if you are training for a race... You may have, if you're an athlete of any kind, really, you probably have somebody who's, who's uh, retired from that sport that you kind of would kind of idolize their philosophy for their sport or things that you know, they've done, crafted their, their athletic ability towards. They're kind of these mentors. So um, we can learn from the people who have run ahead of us, who have run the race a couple times now, and we can sit and listen to them kind of gain some philosophical guidance from. These kind of mentors um, or veterans in the race are key to running a smart race and being a smart runner. We need to have coaches, leaders. I think this is different. A coach is somebody that, you, that you're performing in front of, that they might be able to say, okay, what you did there was, and you should probably try it this way. So I think a veteran and a mentor is someone that you would check in with uh, semi-frequently, but your coach is right there along with you that you're checking in with more frequently. Uh, coaches, someone that leads you, uh, uh, they, you know, they, they have done what you do, or maybe they're doing it at the same time. They, you can do it in front of them, get immediate practical feedback, and they provide some practical guidance rather than the philosophical stuff. And then there's also in a race, you also have the, uh, the other racers and the, the peers, these people that you can use to spur you on. Iron sharpens iron, right? Who can you run with? It's important that we don't race alone. We push each other. Times when you can lead someone and times when you can draft behind someone to help you along. We're just trying to be a smart runner here. And then we need to make sure that we're running our race. Don't, uh, don't try to do somebody else's race. God has put you in place on your mission in, in your race, specifically because you are you. You're not somebody else. So do what God has called you to do. Be aware, be aware of your talents and gifts. Be aware of where the position that God has placed you. Run 
your race. Uh, run your race. Yeah. Know your course, seasons, train appropriately, run your race. And you could put an extra emphasis on your race. Run your race. God divinely placed you there for a reason. You can do something in your position that only you can do. You're there for a purpose. It's not an accident that you're there. And then the last one here, stay the course. When you've bathed your, your planning in prayer, when you've taken prayer to how you set your schedule, trust that plan. Because it's not just your plan, it's also God's plan. When, when, this, when, you're, when your plan and, you, and your, your course um, has been planned in prayer, trust that plan. Because constant course correction leads to additional worry and stress. You're always second-guessing yourself. Maybe we should be doing this. Maybe I should be doing that. You're just building yourself. Trust the plan that you feel God has put you on. Trust that plan. The second column there, we're going to go quickly on the second column now. And um, I think it demands a, a, a strict discipline of spiritual disciplines. I'm just going to go quickly through this list of seven. And I think what, when Damon was talking, take what he said there. This is not a, I don't want this to become the task list that he was talking about. Now we have to work at these. And this is because we want to fall in love deeper with Jesus. So having a, having a set of spiritual disciplines is very, very key in, in growing in our love for him. So these are the seven that I, and most people would, would, would say are, are key. Worship, We've got to be worshiping. We need time to be in His Word. And I, I would say this is aside from lesson preparation. Don't let curriculum define your habits of getting in, in the Word. Don't let somebody who wrote it in an office in Colorado somewhere, not that there's anything wrong with Colorado, but don't let that person define your love for the Word. Okay? It's your own. Prayer, we can't forget it's not enough just to talk about God, it's more important to talk with God. Our times talking with God will bring clarity and substance when we actually do talk about Him. I like that thought there. That, that word I was used on purpose. It gives substance. When we have talked with God, it gives substance to when we talk with or about God. Um, fasting. It's not being controlled by anything. Exercising self-control and discipline. Um, by setting up times of fasting. So I've kind of done this. I'll just give you my example of fasting because I think fasting is pretty broad. It's not just, you know, only drinking juice for whatever a month or, you know, there's lots of different things. But uh, so I've done, try to, in, 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 in a month view, the first week of the month, I will try to break my addiction to Pepsi. And I'll go without Pepsi for the week. It's Each difficult. Month. What's that? Each month. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is like the first week of the year. I'm Pepsi free. No, e each month exactly. The second, the second one, I'll I'll sacrifice. So I'm I'm breaking addiction. Then I'm sacrificing. I'll I'll do without um, some uh, some lunches and meals throughout the week. And then I have this habit. The third month, the third week of the month, I have a the habit. I'm trying to break this habit of I'm not. Popping down every night and checking, catching up on my Netflix TV shows or the ones that are loaded up on my DVR that I haven't got to. That just become that has become a habit for me. I don't want to be controlled by anything. And the fourth week week of the month, I I'm following what God has led me to do for whatever would be unique for that month. But you can always guarantee. You can I, uh, I want to say you can guarantee that I'm doing this, but I this is my goal: break addiction, sacrifice. And uh, kill kill habits. Another spiritual discipline, evangelism. It keeps us to it keeps us connected to the urgency and to the mission that we're on. And I don't think that giving kids an invitation at kids' church counts. This is personal evangelism. Staying um, close to people who aren't always just church people. That uh, maintaining those relationships with people who need Jesus. Uh, solitude, I think, is a great spiritual discipline to try to achieve. This one's the most difficult for me, solitude. 
Remove the noise. Remove from clutter. There are times for input, yes. There are times for contemplation, yes. There are times for output. Uh, and I think media, Twitter, Facebook, so it so inundates our lives. That we, const we constantly get stuck in this input mode. That things are always getting our attention, begging for our attention. And uh, I think solitude is very, very key to this. We need to have times um, of just reflection. And uh, Andy, I'm going to use you and your kids' camp as an example for this for me because it was a very um, eye-opening experience that I went and s spoke at a camp that Andy was putting on and it was uh, Lost Lake, which literally means it's out there. You get lost trying to find this lake. And the close, there was no cell phone reception. The closest landline is 30 minutes away. So we're totally disconnected. And I found myself kind of like shaking. inadvertently shaking or checking my phone, thinking I must have missed something on Twitter. Oh, there's no reception. And it took actually a couple days for me to realize Man, my brain is actually clearer because I'm not actually, I'm not, I'm not constantly getting fed with all these things of information that I thought was important for me because I have to know what the newest news in the Mariners is or, you know, whatever. Although it is important, but it's not, it doesn't need to be inundating me all the time. So from that experience, I realized I need to cut that back. I need to cut that back because it doesn't give me any time for that contemplation thinking I'm going to constantly input mode. So, Andy, thanks for letting me do that. Appreciate it. And then Sabbath, um, the last spiritual discipline there. Sabbath. Did, did you get them all? No. no. Okay, I'll go back through them real quickly here. Worship, word, prayer, fasting, evangelism, solitude, Sabbath. Find your Sabbath. I'm not going to stand up here and say it has to be on a day. But find your Sabbath, find whatever, whatever time that you can create in your schedule for that. Um, rest. God rested. If you don't think you have to, we might have a mission. <laughs> protect it. A friend once, once said to me, he said, I protect my Sabbath so much. He had been a senior pastor. He had all kinds of different roles. He, said, well, he was a senior pastor at one place. He protected his Sabbath so much that if someone on his Sabbath passed away, and he had chosen um, Monday to be his Sabbath day, if someone, family member in the, uh, somebody in, in the church died on Monday, his thing was, you know what? They'll still be dead on Tuesday. Tell me about it then. Wow, that's pretty intense. But he protected it so much. And of course, his staff, people knew people who were closest, and then he would want to know information, but he was very, very strict on protecting that. He wanted to make sure that, that, there, was, that there was guards there. Question? So what does that look like? Sabbath? Yeah. What yeah. Is, your rest? is that like making sure that you're not reading books about leadership, or what, what is well, your Well, you know, I, I would say it's, it's, it is Sabbath from your work, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a break from your work. Um, your growth, she, she asked about reading books, does that mean... Like, if that's, if that's something that you do for growth, I don't think you take a break from growing. You take, a, you take a break, take a step back from your work. Saying, okay, gain, I'll gain some perspective. Take a, so, um, if you're reading for your work. Then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's study time for work, then there might, yeah, the, protect, maybe some protection needs to go in there or some margin needs to be put in place there. Um, okay. Six minutes past what I thought, so we can, we'll go quick. I really want to get into this idea here. How we approach our mindset. You can flip the page now to the back page of your handout. <coughs> How we approach our mindset, getting our mind right, is very, very key. All this other stuff is kind of preemptive to this thought here. We need to be very aware about how we work pray, and feel. So let's start with this. I think it's important that when we approach how we do our work, that we work like a servant. Work as though you were a servant. Now be careful, it's not a slave. There is a difference. Work as though you are a slave. Or excuse me, as you were a slave. <laughs> not a slave. A willing servant. This is someone who has opted in to servanthood. 
there's an idea of the bond servant, someone who is now bonded to their master and wants to see their master's desires and things come, come forth and, and, and uh, come true. So when we have this mindset right, we work like a servant, that makes us realize that there's nothing below a servant. When the master asks, I do. There's nothing below you when you're his servant. You do what the master is saying. You're willing, you're accepting of whatever mission he sends you on. You're humble, operating from your master's heart and desires, not a list of tasks. You want to operate from your master's heart and desires. That means you have to know his heart. You have to know his desires. That probably comes from spending time with him. That's why those spiritual disciplines become so key. Not a, not a list of tasks. So I got sent on a... I got, I got a phone call from, our, uh, from my pastor and said, I need you to go do something. There's a family in the church that um, the mom had previously beaten cancer. The cancer is, is back. And the medications and the treatment, it's not working like it did before. And they can't come to a place where they are able to tell their children that mom is dying. They just they can't approach that subject with them. And so they called and asked for a pastor to come and have that conversation. And he said, Nick, you're the kid's pastor. Guess what you get to go do? So when you sign up for children's ministry, you think about fun VBS and doing games, and you don't think about sitting in a living room telling a little eight-year-old girl that her mom is about to die. You don't want to do these things. But when we have our mind right, I realize that I'm going to do my work as, as a servant. I'm going to do the mission that he's put me on. That was a very hard day for me. Very hard day. How we deal with that kind of stuff. Um, well, we'll get to that. And then the next point here. When we approach our prayer, it's very important that we approach it and we have our mindset such that we pray like an owner. Because when you own your business or you own something, you realize that it's on you. Your business will fail. If it's not you. And so, if you're not approaching your prayer life like an owner, guess what? Something's going to fail. Um, you've got to be passionate about it. You're so passionate about, or you have to be passionate in your prayers. You're so passionate. And you, you, you come to the point where you realize, God, I've got to see this happen. This plan, this dream that you've given me, I, I have to see it happen. As an owner, this is the kind of urgency, this is the kind of passion that you feel. You have a belief. Nobody goes and starts their own business and, and, and things thinking that, oh, we're going to fail at this. I'm going to start this thing, but I know it's going to not work. There's a belief that comes along with being an owner. And when you are praying like an owner, you're realizing, God, I believe that you've sent me here. Belief is a big, big thing. Persistence, persistence, persistence. Very important. And, and again, like I said, we realize that it's up to us. Pray like an owner. And this last one about feeling uh, is a harder one for me. But when we have our minds set right, we work working like a servant, we're praying like an owner, and we feel like a passerby. We feel like a passerby because the results are not up to you. That's a hard one. Results are not up to you. Yes, do and give your best as a servant, but then... Believe that it's going to work without you. Um, I, 
Jared Cooksey over here and I got the opportunity a while ago now, a long time ago, to speak at a uh, Royal Family Kids Camp. Anybody familiar with Royal Family Kids Camp? Great ministry. Working with kids and foster system that have, uh, or kids who have been abused, neglected, this kind of thing. So these kids have these stories that are just mind-blowing. And I remember being there at that camp, we did speaking, and um, Jared and I had a conversation with kind of like the camp grandma and grandpa, and they had been doing this Royal Family Kids Camp, just, as, just to be there to love on these kids for years. And we were like at the last night, and we're thinking, man, hearing, some of the, hearing about some of these stories of these kids, how can we be, how can this be, that? we need to do camp for another week. And then you realize, no, then we'll have to just keep on doing it, keep on doing it. How do you come to the end of the camp and not just like be distraught? And they said something that just kind of wrecked me. And been, I think about it often. We've learned to trust in God. They are his kids way more than they are our kids, they said. Oh, to think that they could put everything into this camp and just love, 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 and then all of a sudden, they're passing by. They've learned to feel like a passerby story of my, my pastor. Uh, his name's Dean. He was at a gas station. He's filling up gas in his car. He says, uh, I mean, he, he hears somebody, hears somebody, hey! You're the man! <laughs> he's like, yeah, you! You're the man! He's like, me? He's like, you're, the, you're that guy? You're that guy from that church, aren't you? Yeah, I, I go, yeah. The one, the life center down the road. Yeah, I, I went to your. You are the man. You're the man. Hey, can I get a ride? <laughs> oh, okay. And Dean's like, uh, sure. Oh no, no, no. I'm sorry. He, he asked, the guy asked for money. Hey, can I get a cake? Well, I'm trying to get down to the such and such place. Like, well, I, I don't have. He says I don't have any money. I can give you a ride. He gets into the car or finish filling up the the gas tank. Gets in the car and. Um, close the door, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the smell of just this guy's been drinking a lot, and he can it just smell it just, it immediately. He's still in the car, and uh, begins to talk to him like, "Hey, when did you come to the church?" Like, oh, it was you know. He's just like, and "When you were talking, man, you're you're so good. You're you're just you're just a man." He's just kind of repeating that thing over and over again, and uh, shares and talks about him or talks to him. And uh, wants to get him, you know, to a safe place, or maybe, maybe even checked into a, some sort of treatment center, something like this, because you could tell through the guy telling his story in the car ride that he had a problem, and he was addicted. The guy really needed to go here, so Dean dropped him off and drove away. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You never know. You're not going to know how the story ends. What, what's going to happen to this guy? Well, he's realizing that we need to feel like a passerby. We do our best with the time that God gives us, but then we realize the results are not up to us. But it does happen through the course of life and ministry that stress builds up and we begin to get our thinking messed up. We begin, and there are some big dangers in getting our thinking messed up. So, what happens when we work like an owner? When our thinking gets messed up and we begin to work like an owner, we start to believe that everything depends upon me. When we put our, when we approach it like an, um, I'm, I'm going to have to be the one who gets here way earlier than everybody else and stay. I have to be the one who stays later than everyone else. We, we, try, we begin to try to control the outcomes. We think, uh, or we, 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 we become control freaks of others and the processes that we put in place. When we work like an owner, our family suffers. How many how, our, our family suffers? How many multi-million-dollar 
uh, CEOs of major global corporations say, man, I got all this money, but my family's distant. Or the, the, you know, their, their marriage splits up because although he provided financially for the family, or she provided financially for the family, but now they're split and gone. This is the kind of thing that happens when we work like an owner. And it's really puts us in a place where our lifestyle truly is out of balance. And then, what happens when we work like a passerby? If we get our, if our, we get our thinking mixed up even more, when we work like a passerby, well, we're lazy, excellence, quality begins to suffer, begins to suffer. Our commitment for the long term to the mission that we on, that we're on, begins to fade. We have no long term commitment to that mission, and it begin people begin to realize that you don't really care. That's why it's critical to have our mindset right. It's dangerous to work like an owner or work like a passerby, making sure that we are continuing to work. As a servant. But then, what happens when we pray like a servant? What happens when we pray like a servant? We lack passion. Okay, God, whatever. You just let me know. You let me know. I'm your servant. You just let me know. Let me know, God. And we don't take any personal responsibility for our prayer, for our prayers. It's like we, we ask God to do everything. God, would you send somebody to do your work? God, I'm lonely here in the mission. God, would you just send somebody? Send somebody? There's that family who needs somebody. Hmm. I think maybe he has the person. That's, that's you. When you pray like an owner, you realize, okay, God is in me. And then what happens when we pray like a passerby? Oops. When we pray like a passerby, I don't think the prayer life even exists. There's no reason to, to pray. Ah, yeah, whatever happens, happens. Whatever's going to be is going to be. We'll just look, we'll just play it out, see how it goes. I'm gonna approach my prayer just like a passerby. And prayer life is non-existent. A dangerous place to be. And then when our thinking gets mixed up, what happens when we feel like an owner? When we feel like an owner, we tend to get prideful and arrogant. We begin to think that, hey, this is here because of me. And this is here for me. We stop listening to others. We stop learning from others. When we feel like an owner, I got this. I got this. We ex when we feel like an owner, we expect everyone to serve us. We become the source, or we, we become the focus of our uh, everybody else's work. You work for me, rather than you work for the mission. You, you are working for Jesus. When we feel like an owner, and then when we feel like a servant. messes with our mind as well. We begin to develop a victim mentality. Woe is me. I'm just, and I put just in quotes, I'm just the children's worker. You know, there's not enough of this. I, I'm just the victim of the place that God has put me. 
when we feel like a servant, we forget the unique role that we have on the mission that God has put us on. A, an emphasis on unique role. And then when we feel like a servant, we increasingly see our gifts and talents as a curse rather than the blessing for others. I had a conversation with one of the guys, young well, students at our church, He's a phenomenal drummer, He's constantly being asked to drum places. And he said, I, I wish I, in, in not so many words, he, he said, I wish I couldn't, I, I could I hope that was a bad drummer. Because then people would stop asking me to use my gift. <laughs> like, what? You want to not use the gift that God has given you? It sounds like you're a victim of your gift. You feel, you be, I think you are feeling like a servant. I think like you're, you're feeling, your, your, your mind has gone wrong. I coached him a little bit to say, you know, let's build some margin in your life. Let's, let's, get a, let's get a disciplined schedule here. And that way you know what places you can say yes and what places you can say no. But feeling like a servant develops us to become the victim, or makes us think that we're the victim. And our gifts and talents increasingly become seen as a curse rather than a blessing for others. So that's why it's so important to have our mind be set, our mindset be balanced and healthy. When we pray, or excuse me, we work like a servant, we pray like an owner, and we feel like a passerby. I think if anyone can master this, you're far ahead of me and everybody else. <laughs> but it's we're all on a race to see. Uh, we've got five minutes. Other comments or even questions from anybody else uh, or anybody about the, and if you miss something on the, you like wanted to get clarification on the, on the blank there, we can time to ask. Okay, Resist the desire to have what you want to find what blank is or isn't. Um, oh, yes, success. Yes, success. You resist that desire. You know what? I, I put that in on the handout and um, didn't update on that on the, the, these notes here. you got to resist that desire that what you want is called success and maybe not what God would call success is success. Yeah. How do you balance that between um, determining what a win is, you know, in a in a ministry, so um, so you know you're on the right track? Does that make sense? Yeah. How you balance the difference? Yeah, I I I think what you're saying there is um, the, the question being how do you how what's the point of ever defining a win if if you if you if you're saying it's not what you what your idea of a success is necessarily I think. When you've worked as a team and you've bathed that process in prayer, you get you get this picture of a success. And, and rather than you know, this is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. This is what the the goal that God has put us on, or the, the target that God has placed before us. I think I think how you arrive at the definition of the win is very key. If it's if it's just hey, I told you to do it. That's what's going to be success for us. Rather than we feel God has told us this. How we would arrive at the definition of success. Other blanks that need to get filled in or other questions? Or just comments? Things that you've seen this played out in your in your life or in your ministry? It's, it is. It is very simple of, of a thought process, but it's it's Profound, isn't it? Yeah. And this is a little specific, but I wrestle with this. I wonder if you or others do. But when we talk about Sabbath and being in, in, in ministry, you know, you mentioned Monday. How much work should we, pressure should we put on ourselves to coordinate our Sabbath with our family's Sabbath or children? Do you wrestle with that? Yeah, I do. That? You know, totally. Because two of my four kids, well, three of uh, the, the third, they're going to school yeah. on the day that I'm home. And so it totally takes that idea of being able to spend my Sabbath with family out of the out of the possibility. So it's there is that um, dichotomy. Dichotomy, yes. It's like we've got, yeah. But um, I try, you know, you try to make the most of the, the those moments. So I pick them up from school, um, and you know, that's 
this moment. And we live about a half an hour from school, so that, that car ride is, is precious to me. And the, was, so the, like Monday afternoon, uh, we're throwing football or whatever season of sport that my son was into, the oldest son was into at the time. Um, so we capitalize on the, you know, between 3.30 and, and uh, bedtime hours because my Sabbath, you know, it's not uncommon that the Monday night homework isn't getting judged. But then I think we say it's about Tuesday night and Wednesday night. 